Did you know they added smart-ish keyframes to DaVinci Resolve 18.5? No, me neither. I totally missed it amongst a few other things. So I've compiled a bit of a list of the additional things which are included in DaVinci Resolve 18.5, which you and I initially kind of missed. And everything we're going to talk about in this video is available in the free version because we're not talking about any of the big headline features. We're talking about some of the smaller, nice little inclusions which just make our lives that little bit easier. So let's get into it. This framing will make sense in a moment. But before we do, let me just thank this video sponsor, Motion VFX. I personally use Motion VFX in nearly all of my videos. Why? Because they look great and they're really easy to use. And they have a huge selection of plugins available for DaVinci Resolve, like the MKBHD pack or the M Keynotes pack, which are two of my favorites. Plus, they're adding new plugins and new packs every single month. So if you fancy checking out Motion VFX for yourself, click on the link down in the description below. Right, let's, uh, let's switch back over here. And we're going to kick things off with some really quite small things, but they're worth mentioning. The first one, you can now clear in and out ranges for multiple clips. This is actually kind of useful. So you can see here, we have a couple of clips and each one has in and out points. Now, previously, to get rid of those, you'd have to go onto each one and get rid of the in and out. What we can now do is just highlight everything within here and then I'm going to hit Alt and X or Option if you're on a Mac and that's just going to clear the ins and outs for every single clip that I selected. Only a small one, but it means you don't have to open every single clip every single time. Makes life that little bit easier. On a similar-ish note, they've now added the ability to clear recent media history. Now this actually pointed me to something which I didn't know was there already. There's a real quick and easy way to switch between your recently opened clips, which I didn't know existed. So on the edit page, I've got one of these clips open, doesn't matter which one, any of them. And at the top, you've got this little drop down and you give that a click and you can switch between your recently opened clips. So I can just hop to this one and this one, even if I've got a different bin open within the media pool. I can simply swap between my recently opened clips, which is, again, nice and useful. Now, the thing they've added, if we click on the three little dots over to the right, there's now an option to clear recently viewed clips, which will just wipe that history. And then I can go back in and open them up if I need to. Small one, but again, useful. Next up, this one isn't documented anywhere, and I stumbled on it purely by accident. There's now a much easier way to set the default duration of transitions. So if I just grab any old transition on the edit page, put it on my edit point like so, and then give it a click. In the inspector, where you have all of your transition controls, there's now a new button set as default duration. So if I make this transition, let's say a second long, and then set as default, and we can just delete that one off the timeline, grab a new one, put it on there, and it's one second in length. If we want much shorter ones, let's go with 0.4, set as the default, get rid of that, grab another one, it's automatically 0.4. Now you could do that before, but you'd have to go and drill into the preferences, blah, 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 blah. Now it's just that little bit easier. Small things which just go a long way. Next up, we have the Render Cache Manager. Clearing your cache within DaVinci Resolve used to be a bit hit and miss. It was kind of a guessing game. You'd click on playback, go clear your cache, and you wouldn't really know what it was doing. You didn't know how much storage your cache was taking up on your system. None of those things. They've made it easier with the Render Cache Manager. It'll make sense when I show you what it does. So on the edit page, if we click on playback and then go to delete render cache, you used to just click on all and you'd hope that it would delete all of your render cache, but you wouldn't know how much storage it was actually freeing up. Now you have this manage cache data. Give that a click and this cache manager will appear. So this, this render cache over here is telling you how much storage, how much cache you have for each of these individual projects. So these are all my projects within the local database and here's how much storage they are taking up. Now what you can even do, if we change the location to all, we can see all of the projects across all of my different libraries or databases, as well as how much storage they're taking up. If we scroll up to the very top, if we click on the word render cache, we can actually order this by size. So I've actually got one that's taken up 560 megabytes. I'm actually quite good at clearing them, so I haven't got anything taking up too much storage. But you can see these are taking up a bit of space. We can just tick these boxes and then hit clear cache. 
and it's just going to go through and delete all the relevant files and job done. Cache. Cache is just a temporary pre-rendered version of the clips on your timeline. So if you're in a project and you add some fusion or you add some titles or transitions, DaVinci Resolve will cache those clips. It will pre-render them with those effects baked in so it doesn't have to render them every single time. So what happens if you delete that cache? All you're doing is you're deleting those temporary files. So you won't break anything. It just means next time you go into that project, it may run a little bit slower or you'll have to wait for those clips to be cached once again. Cache. Next up, reorder tracks in the tracks index. There was never previously an easy way to reorder your tracks, just to swap the order of them on your timeline. Now you can thanks to the tracks index. If you've never heard of the index, let me show you where it lives and what it does, and then I'll show you this new feature. So on the edit page, once again, if we click on index in the top left hand corner, we get this appear. By default, you'll be taken to the edit index. Now this big list here is a list of all of the clips on my timeline. We've got the source in, out, duration, frame rates, names, all sorts of useful information. If we right click on the column headings, we can choose which columns we have within here. And if we click on any of the clips, we can actually jump to that clip on the timeline. Now, quick tip while you're in here, you can also search by clicking on the magnifying glass. And if you click on the three little dots, you can actually filter. So if you want to see all the clips on your timeline, which have transform effects applied, give that a click. There's everything which has a transform applied and you can jump to them on the timeline. That's the index. That's what it does. At the very top, we've got a couple of tabs. You can see the middle one is called tracks. If we give that a click, we can see all of the tracks on this timeline. Again, this is really useful. If you want to lock tracks, you can come and do it from here. It's much easier than having to scroll up and down on your actual timeline. You can right click and change the track color. You can also see whether your audio tracks are mono by one, studio by 2.0. There's all sorts of stuff you can do within here. The thing they've added is the ability to reorder tracks. So if I grab video one and then drag up, you can see it's just changed on my timeline. We can just reorder the tracks as we need to. Always lazy, I haven't actually named my tracks very well here. Let's do voiceover and music. Drag voiceover down. There you go, music, voiceover. So you can just reorder your timeline as you need to, quickly and easily. Next up, a pretty niche one, we have custom pixel aspect ratios. This is particularly useful for those shooting anamorphic which I'm doing right now, hence this different angle. In particular, those shooting with the Suray 1.6x full frame anamorphic lenses. Previously, there was no way to do a 1.6 de-squeeze within DaVinci Resolve, but now you can, because you can set your own custom pixel aspect ratios, which just goes to make our lives a little bit easier. So I've got some anamorphic footage here. Let's open this up and you can see it's all squished. If we right click within the media pool and we're going to go to the clip attributes and then we have pixel aspect ratio, scroll up to the top, you have all of your anamorphic options. There's no 1.6. Previously, we'd have to go 1.5 and then figure it out from there. But there is a custom option now. If we give that a click, we get a box. We can just type in 1.6 and then click OK. And there we go. Our footage has been correctly de-squeezed. Winner. Next up, there are new transitions and effects. I have mentioned this in my previous main 18.5 video, but I think it's just worth mentioning again. They've added some funky new transitions and effects to the free version of DaVinci Resolve. They're nothing major, but they're nice additions, more options for more creativity and more fun doing silly transitions and effects is never a bad thing. So if we just open up the effects library, video transitions, fusion transitions, we have all of these new options within here, like a block glitch, a circle spin. We have an edgy, a detail dissolve, a fold. We've got a glow, a logo wipe. We have a luma wipe. And if we keep scrolling down, there's even more down here, like an RGB splitter for an RGB glitch style effect, radial, shash, shash, uh, tile wipe, loads of stuff within there. If we go to effects, fusion effects, which is near the top, more options within here too. So we've got a graphics cross overlay, a shape overlay, highlight stretch, noise distortion, repeat, shape circle, paper edge, slice, all sorts of stuff within here. This paper edge one is a cool one. You can do this on text. So I've got this text here, which just says paper yo. And if we drop the paper edge on there, 
it gives us a paper style effect, which is pretty cool. You could do that on images as well as video too. There's another one down here, which is shape circle. So I'm gonna drop that on my footage down here. And by default, it just gives us a circle, which is not too exciting. But if we go to the inspector and effects, we can actually apply this as a mask. And that's a nice, easy way of just doing a circle mask on the edit page. You can now stabilize multiple clips all in one big go, which is a massive winner. It was a pain to do previously. You'd have to do them one by one. Now, if you simply highlight multiple clips on the timeline, open the inspector, go to your normal stabilize options, and they will stabilize one by one, which is a big time saver. Last but not least, I mentioned them at the beginning, smart keyframes. Now, Blackmagic didn't call these smart keyframes in the support documentation, but I'm calling them smart keyframes because it kind of makes sense. This allows you to use a keyboard shortcut to apply keyframes on the edit page, and DaVinci Resolve will figure out where it thinks you want that keyframe to go. It is actually quite clever. It's a bit strange to get used to, but once you're used to it, it should speed up your workflows. This also makes it much easier to apply audio keyframes, which is probably one of the biggest winners from this new feature. So what are the keyboard shortcuts? So to add a keyframe, you use command or control and then the squared open bracket. And to delete a keyframe, you use option or alt and then the squared closed bracket. And as mentioned, these use a priority order. So this is the order in order. At the very top, we have the retime controls, if they're already active, speed ramps and all that sort of thing. We then have the active effect curve in the keyframe editor on the timeline itself. Underneath that, we have the last used inspector control. And if none of those are active, it will use the audio volume gain to add the keyframe. That sounds confusing. Let me show you how it works in practice and it'll make a whole lot more sense. So here we are back on the edit page. Now this clip here doesn't have any transform effects or speed ramps or anything at all applied to it. So if we simply move our playhead to where we want and then we'll hit our keyboard shortcut to add keyframes. And as you can see, it's adding keyframes onto our volume, which is really quick and really easy way of just adjusting the volume directly on the timeline like so, which as I say, is really, really useful. Now, the next thing on top of that in terms of priority is the last used transform settings. So all I'm gonna do, go to transform, let's zoom in a little bit on this clip. I've not added a keyframe yet, I've just zoomed in. Now, if we hit my keyboard shortcut, it's not adding audio keyframes. If we look in the inspector, it's adding keyframes to my zoom because that was the last used transform controls. If we go and adjust the rotation a little bit, again, we've not added a keyframe just yet. If I use my keyboard shortcut, I'm now adding keyframes for the rotation. Now, if we open up the keyframe editor on the timeline, you can see these are the keyframes we just made for zoom. And if we go to rotation, here's the rotation ones. Now, if we open up a different one, let's just go with pitch. Even though we've not amended anything for pitch, because we have the keyframe editor open for pitch, if we use our keyboard shortcut, we'll be adding keyframes onto pitch. Now, just to show you, if I want to delete one of these, all I simply do, make sure my playhead is over the keyframe, we'll do the delete keyboard shortcut, and we can get rid of those. Now, our final priority is our retime control. So if we just open retime controls up, so now we have our speed change, now we can just use our keyboard shortcut once again to add keyframes and it's adding them on there like so. And now if we make our way backwards, let's just turn off our retime controls and we'll open up the zoom. That same keyboard shortcut will do those. If we close our keyframe editor on the timeline like so, now let's just go and move the yaw, for example, and now do the keyboard shortcut. We're now doing the yaw. And then if we get rid of all of those, we're now doing our audio keyframes once again. Bit strange to get used to, but it is smart and should hopefully make life a little bit easier. Man, let me know what you think. And that's it for this one. I hope you enjoyed the video. What do you think of this different angle? Let me know down in the comments below. And if I did miss anything else, let me know. Take it easy, folks. I'll see you next time. Bye.